Good day and welcome to our online service. It's great to have you join us. Let's open in prayer as we trust God for a special time together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are so faithful in our lives. We thank you that you are true. You are constant. You are our, our rock, Lord Jesus, upon which we stand, our firm foundation. And so we approach your throne of grace with confidence today, Lord God. Thank you that wherever we are, we come into your presence today, knowing that you are God with us. And we pray, Lord, that this would be a special time. We want to open up our hearts today, Lord, to receive all that you have for us. And we come, Lord, to adore you, to praise you, and to worship you. Be blessed in this time, we pray. Work in our lives, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Wonderful stuff. Let's praise and worship him together. God is great, and He is greatly to be praised. And this morning, as we give thanks to God, as we enjoy Him and as we love Him, I invite you to join me. Why don't you stand where you are? We're going to sing about God's greatness, about His faithfulness, about how strong and mighty He is. Amen. Oh 
loving just forever Before he is good is above all things His loving just forever Saying praise Saying praise Saying praise Saying praise Forever God is faithful Forever God is strong How lovely is your 
dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. Amen and amen. A big thanks, as always, to our, our band, our musos, for a wonderful time of praise and worship. Just to say that we are moving towards live streaming. We might even try something next week. There's some things we're busy putting in place, but we will 
keep you posted. For now, it's a real privilege to be able to share the message with you this morning. And we're going to be continuing our series on seizing the day for Jesus. Uh, remember, the, the heart of the series about, is about living one day at a time, grabbing hold of, seizing hold of each and every day, getting the most out of it for God. All right? We said, though, that we do need to be careful that either the past or the future don't stop us from grabbing hold of and seizing our today. And so last Sunday, we, we began to look at the past. And I shared that picture of the big steel door with you. I said that we need to slam that door on the past. So there is a window in the door because we do want to look back on and we want to remember happy memories over our lifetime. And we especially want to remember the works of God and the words of God over our lives. So there is, that's what we remember. But when it comes to the sins and failures, the guilt and the shame, the lies that uh, people speak over us that are out of line with our identity in Christ, that stuff, we want to shut away behind that door. We want to seal it off, seal it in the past where it can no longer impact and affect our today. Amen. So that's where we at. But I did touch on a potential problem, which we're going to open up some more today. And the problem is this, is that in the past, we go through experiences and, and things happen that can cause us pain. And sometimes we, we like to think we've moved past it, it's behind us, but that pain can sometimes be, I, I used the picture of a steel cap boot planted in the doorway. So we're trying to close the door, but we can't because of this thing that's there. And uh, sometimes we even think we have closed the door, but that boot is in the doorway. It's keeping the door open, and there's still some of this pain and stuff from the past that can filter through and influence our today. So this is something that we're going we're gonna to look at some more. Now, we are especially focusing on pain in the past, okay? But we've got to recognize we could be experiencing the same pain with things that are happening in our lives right now. So the things I'm sharing today will look at both the past and even things that we are busy going through in our lives right now. All right, are we ready? Yeah, we go. Okay, so when we speak about pain, what exactly do we mean? What are we talking about? I'll remind you of that story that I shared with you last Sunday, where Queen Victoria uh, outlived her beloved husband, Albert, by something like 39 years. But many people said that she actually stopped living on the day that he died because she just couldn't get over, she couldn't come out of the pain of his loss. And so when we speak of pain, we're speaking of things like the pain of the loss of a loved one. It could be some abuse or trauma that we've suffered, uh, uh, being the victim of a violent crime. It could be an illness. It could be an accident that really scarred us. It could be um, a, a drastic loss of a business. I mean, there's so many events in our lives that can cause us pain and hardship, all right? And um, these are things which can still influence and, and, and affect how we live out today. That's what we're talking about. So it has a wider rather than a narrow meaning, just so that we get this. Now, to lay a bit of a foundation for where we're going, I want to look at a famous account of Jesus and his disciples caught in a storm out on a boat. Okay, so let's have a look. In Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41, famous account, we read this. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, or though other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up, shouting, Teacher, don't you care that, you, that we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped, and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and waves obey him. There are three big points that I'd like to make from this passage as an introduction. All right, point number one, we all go through storms in life. Friends, this is obvious, but please don't miss it, okay? The disciples had the king of glory, the only begotten son of God in the boat with them, and yet they still went through that storm. When we have Jesus in the boat of our lives, when we are followers of Jesus, our lives are his, it doesn't make us storm-proof in the sense that we're never going to go through storms in life. Obviously not, okay? But it does make us storm-proof in the sense that the storm will never overwhelm us. It will never 
drown us and just have its way with us, okay? This was the point that the disciples missed. Not so, okay? I know recently uh, I finished that book of mine called Can, and, you know, I was looking over and just thinking about what I'd written and thought, sure, I've been through some stuff. We as a family have been through some stuff. But truth be told, friends, we've all been through stuff. You, you, as you watch this, you can look back on your life and you will remember times of trial and hardship and pain that you've been through. We've all been through stuff. Isn't that so? Okay. And so the thing is this, though, friends, there, there are seasons that we, we probably would never want to live through again. There are things we wish that we could undo if it were possible about the past. And Charles Dickens um, wrote that famous book, A Tale of Two Cities, and the book opens with this famous line. It says, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And we experience this in our lives. On the one hand, in one area of your life, you can be having the best of times. Great victory, breakthrough, amazing blessing, okay? And then in another area of your life, it feels like the worst of times. Going through great hardship and trial, and, and there's pain in terms of what you're experiencing. And sometimes we have these things running at the very same time in our lives, best of times and worst of times together, all right? The bottom line is this, friends, as we look over our lives, we know we can't avoid storms. They're going to be there. We all do go through storms, all right? Point number two is that Jesus can change our circumstances. Jesus can change our circumstances. So in my Bible, the heading above this passage is Jesus calms the storm. And if we're honest, that's probably our favorite part about this passage, especially when we find ourselves in the midst of a storm. You know, when you're going through a storm of life and you read this, and you read how Jesus wakes up and he just rebukes the wind and the waves and there's instant calm. We're like, yeah, come on, Jesus, do it in my life, hey? Isn't that so? Friends, when we find ourselves caught in a storm, we want the storm to pass, not so. We want the storm to just blow over instantly for, for the Lord just to bring instant calm and for us to be instantly delivered in the midst of that time. And of course, the, the encouragement for us in this passage is, yes, the Lord can change our circumstances, and even quickly, okay, He can change our circumstances. He will also always bring us through the storm. But here's the thing. There's a third point, which doesn't always excite us quite as much. I preach this even with some trepidation. I'm thinking, okay, Lord, even as I preach this, please don't test me in this. I feel like I've already got enough, okay, before me, <laughs> all right? But here's the thing. Here's the third point. Are you ready for it? Brace yourselves. The third point is Jesus doesn't just want to change your circumstances. He wants to change you. I'll say it again. Jesus doesn't just want to change your circumstances. He wants to change you. He wants to change me, all right? When you and I are in the midst of a storm, God can change those circumstances like that. That's not even hard for Him. He can change them instantly. But He is even more interested in working in us and in changing us along the way. All right. Think about this passage. The storm was almost like a test of the disciples' faith, a test which they didn't do all that well in, to be honest. Jesus told them so. All right. They should have recognized that with Jesus in the boat with them, that storm would never overwhelm them. They weren't going to drown because Jesus Himself was present. In fact, some have pointed out that the disciples themselves should perhaps have done what Jesus did. They should have been the ones who rebuked the wind and the waves, all right? They, uh, they had Jesus with them. They would be fine. But the truth is that storms of life can reveal what's going on inside of us. They can reveal our heart. God uses these storms to, to grow us and, uh, and to transform us and to change us as, as we move forward. And very importantly, storms like this can also point us to God. They get us focused on Jesus. They can even reveal more of who God is in our lives. This is what we see happening with the disciples. At the end of this account, they are in awe. In fact, they're terrified. They say, who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him in this way? Remember another storm, a squall on the Sea of Galilee that the disciples were caught in. This time Jesus wasn't in the boat. He came walking to them on the water. And Peter then also walked on water. And that account ends with these words in Matthew chapter 14, verses 32 to 33. It says, when they climbed back into the boat, that's Peter and Jesus, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. This time it ends with them worshipping and almost like their eyes are open to truly recognize Jesus for who he is, the son of God. Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. What was he saying? I'll give you a classic example of how this works. Let's say you have a Christian who gets to quite a lukewarm place in their relationship with God. Perhaps they're even in a backslidden place. 
And then one day, a storm slams into them. Crisis situation. Okay, what happens next? In an instant, they're on their knees, crying out to God, seeking Jesus with all of their heart. They're praying, they're fasting, they're reading their Bible, they're back in regular fellowship. Okay, their eyes are back on the Lord. What's happened, friends, is that those circumstances have come like a wave and have thrown them against, or you could say, brought them back to Jesus Christ, the rock of ages. Okay, that's, an, that's a good thing. All right. Mark Batterson refers to this, this quote by Spurgeon. And he writes these great words. He says, You may not be responsible for what happened, but you are response-able. Two people can encounter the same obstacle, a difficult diagnosis, a bitter divorce, or even the death of a loved one, yet come out on the other side very different people. One person owns his or her pain, while the other person is owned by it. One person becomes better, while the other person becomes bitter. The difference? You've got to kiss the wave that throws you against the rock of ages. You've got to come to terms with a pain that has made you who you are. All right? We all go through stuff in life. We've established this. We're all going to go through storms. We aren't always responsible for what happens to us, but we are responsible. What we can take responsibility for is how we respond to what is happening to us. And this is so important, friends, because I want to make this point. In order to move forward, we've sometimes got to see the past differently. I'm going to say it to you again, okay? Moving forward often requires us to see our past differently. How we respond can play a major role in how we come out on the other side of that storm, that trial, that challenging time. Amen? Leonardo da Vinci uh, spoke about two types of imagination. There is pre-imagining. That's the one we probably are more familiar with, where you imagine what the future could be like. But then there is also post-imagining. And what that is, is that's where we reimagine the past. Sounds a bit strange, but I'll explain how it can work for us as Christians. When we reimagine the past, we can go back and look for the hand of God upon our lives, even in the most challenging times. Okay, that's what it means to reimagine. So I'm going to give you a great example, one of my favorites from Scripture. Think of Joseph, all right? So the story begins with this pretty arrogant young man, a little bit arrogant in how he shares his dreams with his family, but then, of course, the brothers come along. They, they sell him into slavery, basically saying to him, you're as good as dead to us, okay? Talk about family rejection. He ends up as a slave in Potiphar's house, but the favor of God is on his life. So what happens? He gets promoted. He's put in charge of the house. Things are looking up until Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him, and when he won't give in, she falsely accuses him. He gets thrown in prison, okay? Great reward, you're thinking, for his integrity. But again, the favor of God is on his life. The warden of the prison puts Joseph in charge of the prison. He's there for a number of years. We don't know how long before a day comes where he interprets the dreams of Pharaoh's cupbearer and the baker who are in prison with him. He correctly interprets the dreams. Three days later, the cupbearer is reinstated by Pharaoh, exactly like Joseph had said in the interpretation. So Joseph must have been thinking, prison break, man. I'm out of here. This is my ticket. I'm, I'm free, okay? How long did he still spend in prison? Another two days, another two weeks, try another two years, two years more, longer, forgotten, as it were, in, in this prison cell. And uh, in this time, you can imagine what must have been going through his heart. But when, two years later, the cupbearer suddenly remembers, hang on, Pharaoh, there's this guy in prison who could interpret the dreams that you've had. And of course, he's brought before Pharaoh, he interprets the dreams, and the next thing, he's put in charge of Egypt. Now, his brothers come down during the famine. They come to Egypt seeking food, and eventually Joseph reveals himself to them. They are expecting the worst, as one would expect. They are expecting him to really deal very harshly and severely with them. But we read of Joseph making this amazing statement in Genesis chapter 50, verses 19 to 21. It says this, But Joseph replied, Don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me. But God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. So he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. What an amazing response from a man who had every ability with a power at his disposal to make those brothers suffer for what they did to him. He could have almost ended that line, the covenant people of God. You, you, you kind of think, you know, if he put them all to death, can you imagine what could have happened? But instead, friends, he responds in this incredible, remarkable way. 
Why was Joseph able to do that? Because he had reimagined the past. Joseph had looked back. He'd been through great pain and hardship, but he could look back and see the hand of God upon his life. He could see how it was God who had brought him through and put him in this position where he could save many lives, including the lives of his own family. He could see that it was God who had brought him to this place. Okay? And friends, we often, we often look at things in our past and we see hindrances and we see obstacles. We see weaknesses. Sometimes we ask those why, Lord, questions. Why did I have to go through that, Lord? Why did you make me the way that you made me? What we fail to recognize, friends, is how often not only is God changing us through those things, but he's advancing us. He's actually moving us forward into what he has for us. I'll give you a small example of this. When I share, I have pretty detailed notes. Okay, if you've seen my notes, they're pretty detailed. Okay, now, um, I want to tell you that I, always, I don't share, obviously, word for word. I move around. Sometimes I feel the Lord add things as I'm sharing, and so it goes. But the thing is this. I wish, I wish that I could speak more. That The big word is extemporaneously. I wish that I could jot five words on a page and speak for 30 minutes, all right? And over the years, I've had some hang-ups about the fact that I've got notes. Because often I've been around people, in fact, I had a friend, not yet, but a friend who would often love almost reminding me of how anointed some guys were who didn't use notes. They were anointed, kind of the implication of what I heard him saying is, you're not so anointed because you've got to use notes, okay? Now, don't worry. Over the years, I've come, I've come to peace with it. I know this is how God made me. This is how I work. And actually, there are some advantages and benefits that I've found in writing things out as I do. But here's something else. I was reading something that Mark Batterson wrote recently in his book, Win the Day, which has been a great resource for me even as I've been prepping for this series. And I was so excited when I read it because it witnessed with something God had shown me uh, not so long ago. Okay, so he said this. Mark Batterson also, he actually scripts his messages word for word. Okay, and he made this statement in his book. He said, speaking from an outline would have been much easier. In other words, if you just got a few points on a page. But it wasn't in my wheelhouse. I had no idea at the time, but God was honing my writing. What I perceived to be a speaking weakness turned into a writing strength. And I got so excited when I read this, friends, because I haven't written international bestsellers like he has, but I came to recognize not so long ago that, hang on a minute, the fact that I actually write out messages has helped me in other areas of writing in my life. So in other words, it had become a writing strength, like he said, in other ways. So friends, my point is this. So often we look at something and we think, oh, it's a weakness. It's a hindrance. It's an obstacle. God, why did I have to go through that? Why did you make me the way that you did? And we fail to recognize, friends, that this is God, not only changing us, but actually using those very things to move us forward according to his plans and purposes for our lives. Isn't God amazing? Joseph, friends, first had to learn to be in charge of Potiphar's house, and then a prison before he could be entrusted with being in charge with the nation of Egypt. All right. You know, here's something we can all relate to. We go through some trial in life. We wouldn't choose to. We'd rather avoid it. But we go through something, and we emerge on the other side of that test with a testimony as God has brought us through. That testimony is not just for us, friends. A few months, a few years down the road, we keep running into people who are in the exact same place we were. They're going through the exact same thing, facing the same stuff. And we're able to encourage them and to help them based on what we ourselves had come through and how we've seen God bring us through. Okay? God works in amazing ways, Lord, uh, just to, in terms of the, the Lord bringing us through these times and giving us something that we can then help others further down the road. We've all experienced this. But at this point... I'd like to speak to something that might be a little bit of an elephant in the room. Because even as we talk of hardships and trials, we can think about some awful things that even Christians go through, okay? What about the Christian that is the victim of a terrible, violent crime? I'm not even going to name examples, all right? Or what about the Christian who's diagnosed with cancer? Am I saying that God is the one that gave them the cancer? Are we saying that God orchestrated, he sets up the whole crime that they were a victim of? Obviously not. Absolutely not. We know that sickness comes from hell. The devil is behind all the evil in the world today. We can't credit God with that kind of evil. But here's the amazing thing, friends, and the mystery, because there is a mystery to this, okay? That even in the midst of the most awful, terrible circumstances that we could find ourselves going through, that God is still able still able to turn and to work those things for the good of those who love him and are called 
according to his purposes. This is what the Word of God tells us in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, as we read. And we know that God causes everything. You could underline that word, everything. Not only the good stuff, even the bad stuff. Everything. To work together for the good of those who love, it, love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Now, please hear me carefully. Not for a second am I making light of what people go through. Being the victim of a terrible crime, having to deal with a dread disease, or a host of other awful, terrible circumstances and things that people have to face in this life, Christians especially, okay? These are the kind of things that often have us asking the why, Lord, questions. Why, Lord, did I have to go through this? Why did it happen to me? And to be honest with you, friends, a lot of those hard why, Lord, questions are probably only going to be answered in eternity. We're not going to get all the answers in this side of eternity. But here's the thing. Even as we go through these times, we have this confidence that the Lord will bring us through. He will indeed bring us through. And as only He can, and there's a mystery to this, friends, but as only God can, He's able to turn those things and to produce something good from them, to do something good. They're not good themselves. The circumstances aren't good. But God can somehow bring something good out that will be to His glory, that will be for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purposes. Now, as we come in towards the landing today, I want to speak about two important things that can help us close the door to pain in the past. We are going to finish off. There's another thing I'd like to add next week, but we'll, we'll hit these ones today. They, they're pretty big ones in themselves. Number one, confession. Number one is confession. So last Sunday I shared with you, I said that we are not called to confess each and every sin we've ever committed in order to receive forgiveness from God. I think that would be pretty impossible. Sometimes we sin without being fully conscious of what we're doing. And I mean, I don't know about you, but I can't itemize and list every sin I've ever committed going right back, okay? I don't think that's possible. But having said that, friends, confession helps us when it comes to the past. As some have said, confession is actually good for our soul, all right? And so in the context of healing, we read this in James chapter 5, verse 16. It says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results, okay? You see, friends, when we confess our sin, and especially stuff that we are still struggling with right now, what it does, it brings that stuff out of the darkness and into the light. And just that act alone of bringing something from darkness to light can strip that sin of so much of the power that it has over us and can position us for a place where we can be healed and we can move forward in the freedom that Christ has won for us, okay? I remember as a younger believer um, going through a, a, it was like a discipleship training time where we had to share about stuff from the past that we were ashamed of. And it was a great thing for me at that point in my life because I was still struggling to really accept that God had forgiven me for all the stuff that I'd done wrong, okay? There were certain things that were really bothering me. And just to sit with that trusted pastor friend of mine and to be able to just get stuff off my chest, to be able to speak about things that I was deeply ashamed of and to hear that I was forgiven. Friends, that day, it really helped me to close the door on the guilt and the shame of that stuff in the past. So there really is a place for confession. Now, I'm not advocating a Roman Catholic kind of a confession. We're not talking about that at all, okay? Um, but I do believe, I do believe, friends, we'd be a whole lot healthier emotionally, spiritually, even physically, if we would take time to confess. Our confession is always first and foremost to God, but there is a place to confess to a trusted Christian friend, to a mentor, to a leader in our lives, Christian leaders whom we trust. Another word these days that's often used is the word accountability, that we have accountability relationships, people who can ask us the hard questions, but not just for the sake of trying to be a policeman to catch us out, but so that we can confess. If we're struggling with something, we can bring it into the light, and we can pray about it, we can deal with it, and we can live free of it, all right? So confession is important. Now, there is also a place, friends, not only to confess the sins we've committed in our wrongs, but actually also to confess, to acknowledge sins and wrongs that were committed against us, all right? Things that have caused us pain in the past, which can still linger. And I want to say at this point that I really do believe in counseling. There really is a place for counseling. You know, again, we've spoken about this earlier, but sometimes we we go through something, there is pain, we, we shut it out, or we think we have. We think we've closed the door. We think we've moved on. But 
That doorway is still open. There's still pain from the past that is affecting how we live today. And friends, this is where Christian lay counseling or professional counseling, in other words, counseling with someone who's a trained professional can be so, so important in helping us to be able to come free of, of those, those burdens and the pain, to really live free and to be healed. All right, so that's important. I think there's often been a stigma associated with counseling, and it's, it's so sad. Now, in fact, recently I've heard some significant, famous Christian leaders, church leaders, speaking about counseling they went through, even as pastors, after years in ministry, and how it helped them. All right, so that's something to, to consider as well. Remember, kissing the wave is about acknowledging and owning the pain of the past. We don't have the power to change our past. And sadly, friends, we sometimes think if we just ignore it, we just pretend it didn't happen, that it's going to go away. Sadly, it doesn't work like that. But if, if we would acknowledge, um, if we would own, if you like, the pain that was caused to us, it helps us, friends, to be able to move forward and to move to a place where that pain no longer owns us and has a hold over us in our today. Does that make sense? hope it does. Second big thing we're going to speak on very quickly is forgiveness, all right? Vital, vital thing about closing the door to the pain of the past is forgiveness. Now, if you think about it, think about some of the most painful experiences of your life, things that caused you the most pain. Very often, there will be someone involved, someone or maybe more than one person who is involved in causing you pain, okay? It could have been, and very often is, someone close to you, someone you loved, someone whom you respected. Okay, so when we speak of question, uh, uh, forgiveness, question number one is, how often do we feel like forgiving those who've wronged us? Answer, hardly ever. In fact, probably the true answer is never. Isn't that so? Man, we want them to suffer like they made us suffer. Isn't that so? All right, that's often where we find ourselves. Question number two, though, is do we have to forgive those who've wronged us? And the answer, absolutely. Absolutely. Why? Because God commands it. Because God has freely forgiven you and me in Jesus Christ and thus expects us to do likewise. All right? But not only does God command it, friends, but we have to forgive. We really have to for our own health, for our own sake. So often, friends, you've encountered a, a situation like this. You might have found yourself there. I have in life where it's like a double whammy. Okay? So person A really hurts person B. They wrong them. Okay? Person A carries on with their life. I'm not saying they walk away scot-free. There is an accounting to God one day. There's an answering to God. But they carry on with their lives. But person B, not only have they been wronged and hurt at a certain time, okay, they can't get beyond the pain of what happened to them. They find themselves caught up in bitterness and unforgiveness, and they end up being a captive to this thing, unable to freely move forward and to live for God as they should today. I've been there, as I said. I truly believe. I truly believe that there are few things as powerful as unforgiveness to keep the door open to the past and to allow this pain and hurt and all this stuff to keep on coming through and affecting how we live for God today, okay? It affects us emotionally, physically. Like I said, I can remember a time where there was bitterness and unforgiveness in my heart, and it actually affected my physical health until I dealt with it and chose to forgive. So again, I'm not making light of what you went through. Some people have suffered great traumas and terrible pain at the hands of others. We're not making light of it, friends. We're not, not at all. But we've got to recognize that not only does God command us to forgive because he has freely forgiven us so much in Christ, but we have to forgive for our own sake so that we can come out of that prison cell and so that we can journey forward. Don't wait until you feel like forgiving the person or the people because, to be honest, that probably will never happen. You'll probably never feel like it, Okay. It's a decision in Christ and by the grace of God to release and to forgive someone, okay? And again, yeah, this is something that it might help you if you were to talk through and to pray through with a trusted Christian friend or leader, all right? But don't wait a day longer. Don't be a prisoner for one day longer and extend your own suffering for one day longer. Even today, by the grace of God, forgive. Amen. We're going to pray. And I'd invite you to join me as we do so. So uh, let's bow our heads together. Two, one. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you that you enable us, you empower us, you give us grace to be able to slam the door on the stuff that needs to stay buried in the past, our dead yesterdays. Lord, the sins and the failures, the, the pain 
that would try to linger. Even the lies spoken over us, Lord, you give us the grace and the power to be able to close the door on that stuff. Even as you remember it no more, you help us to be able to do the same. But Lord, we recognize the potential for pain that we've experienced in the past from traumas and awful experiences to keep that door open and to cause that stuff to keep flowing through and, and affecting how we live for you today. And so we want to pray, Lord, especially into these two big points of confession and forgiveness, that you would give us grace, Lord, to be able to even own what was done to us, to acknowledge the pain, not to pretend it's not there, but to own it so it no longer owns us. And then, Lord, to be able to forgive those who have wronged us. Oh, Lord, we recognize we need your help with this. And today I want to pray. It might not be for every single person who's watching this right now, but for those who recognize that they've tried to ignore stuff in their past, but it hasn't gone away. You know it's there. And also who have especially struggled to forgive those who hurt them and wronged them. We especially ask today, I ask now in the name of Jesus for special grace by the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to respond in a way that leads to freedom and love. I pray, Lord, that we would acknowledge what happened. We would recognize that although, Lord, you didn't bring about the evil, that, Lord, you are able as only you can to turn things and to bring something good from the most awful of times even. Only you can do that, Lord. And we recognize, and even some of the things that we thought were, were mistakes or we would think of as disadvantages and think of, well, why did I have to go through it? We recognize, Lord, how you work through those things, not only to change us, but even to move us forward according to your plans. Oh, Lord, we recognize you blow us away. And we know, Lord, there are some questions even now we, we don't have the answers to and we probably won't have the answers to. But we trust you today, Lord. We know that you're at work in our lives. We know that in the midst of the storm, you are most of all seeking to change us. And so, Lord, we trust you today. We pray now, Lord, we lift up these things to you, and we want to release them to you today. The pain, the hurt of the past, we acknowledge it, and we pray, Lord, that you give us grace to be able to let it go and to close the door, especially through forgiveness. Today we choose. We choose. We don't feel like it, but we choose today by your power and grace to forgive those who have wronged us in our past. Perhaps right now, as you're watching this, there might be specific people you can see. You won't have to go looking for them. They'll be there. The faces will be before you. And maybe they are faces you associate with great pain and hurt and shame in your life. I want to say today, friend, that by the grace and power of God, as you choose to forgive, even when the feelings might not be there, God can do a work in you, a healing work, a liberating, freeing work. And that maybe the feelings might even come later. But I encourage you now, by the power of God and in the name of Jesus, release these people. Hand them, just hand it over. Say, today I choose to release and to forgive them for what they did to me. I freely forgive them as I have been freely forgiven through Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, that right now you heal my heart. Thank you that right now, Lord, I, I come out of this prison cell that I've been living in. I pray that emotionally, physically, spiritually, I would be healed as I release this pain and these wrongs to you in the name of Jesus. We pray this now. We thank you, God, for freedom. We thank you for moving people forward even today. Thank you, Lord, that the past won't stop us from grabbing hold of and seizing today as you have purposed for us. We pray this now confidently in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And together we said, amen and amen. If we've prayed and you still feel, this is a burden, it can happen. Please remember what I said. Please remember it's a place to get together with leaders, with uh, friends, even counselors, just those you trust who can help you to talk through, to walk through, to pray through, and to come to a place of real freedom in Jesus Christ. That's your portion. So I hope this has helped you today. I hope it's encouraged you. Uh, we look forward to another. I've really been enjoying this series. I hope that it's helping you, and uh, we'll continue next Sunday. Thanks so much for joining us today. If you are ready to give, we just want to say thank you so much. We so value your partnership with us through giving really enables us to do that which God has called us to do. So if you are ready to give or if you have given perhaps in this last week, why don't you join me as we pray? And again, Lord, I want to start, I want to end where we started, which is to acknowledge your faithfulness. You are faithful, Lord God. You are faithful, especially as our provider. You take care of us, Lord God. Even in the greatest storms of life, you provide, you bring us through, you care for us. And so, Lord, we, we do want to, with grateful hearts, with glad hearts, bring to you our tithes and offerings. We, Lord, as part of our worship, even just to declare that we trust in you, Lord God, alone. And we thank you now, Lord, that as you bless us and as you protect us, we also pray your blessing upon these finances and their administration. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And together we said,
Amen and amen. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Have an amazing week further. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday. Thank you. Okay.